A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John, Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs he was performing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish feast of Passover was near, and when Jesus raised his eyes and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, Where can we buy enough food for them to eat? He said this to test him, because he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Two hundred days' wages worth of food would not be enough for each of them to have even a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what good are these for so many? And Jesus said, Have the people recline. Now there was a great deal of grass in that place. So the men reclined, about five thousand in number. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were reclining, and also as much of the fish as they wanted. And when they had had their fill, he said to his disciples, Now gather the fragments left over, so that nothing will be wasted. So they collected them, and filled twelve wicker baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves that had been more than they could eat. When the, when the people saw the sign he had done, they said, This is truly the prophet, the one who is come into the world. Since Jesus knew they were going to come and carry him off to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain alone. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to Jesus Christ. Slava Jesus Christo. A little bit of Ukrainian there. Privet, privet. Um, so, uh, uh, here we are on the 17th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Father Francis again with you. Um, so, today we're going to look at the feeding of the 5,000. And we're going to talk about that uh, in just a moment, but I want to kind of refract a couple of things through this gospel because I think uh, they're timely and they make sense. And I hope they'll, well, I hope they'll make sense to you. Um, a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, um, uh, Pastor Jimmy Martin, we, uh, we in the more of the traditional group of Catholic priests kind of refer to uh, James Martin as Pastor Jimmy Martin because, of course, he has such a um, unique theology which is not really congruent with um, uh, true uh, Catholic theology. So I'll just let that go at that. But a few weeks ago, he got a response letter from Pope Francis basically encouraging him in his quote-unquote ministry to the LGBTQRSTUV types. And I kind of want to look at that. And believe it or not, I want to refract that through um, the gospel today. Now, you're probably wondering at this point, now how in the world are you going to talk about uh, Pastor Jimmy Martin and uh, his issues through this gospel? The, the two seem to be like, you know, going like this. Well, that's why you have to be patient. That's why you have to wait and just see how it all pans out. There is a teleological uh, trajectory to this, uh, this train of thought. So anyway, uh, a few weeks ago, I guess uh, Pastor Jimmy Martin was, uh, had wrote a letter to Pope Francis uh, in response, or uh, his nephew, I guess, was uh, confirmed. Apparently, he took the name Francis. Now, it's not clear whether or not he was, said he was doing it because of Pope Francis, which is a little bit um, kind of odd because we, may, we in confirmation, we take the saint, a saint's name like St. Francis of, of Assisi or St. Francis Xavier or St. Francis Cabrini or, you know, St. Francis de Sales. So let's say Vincent, St. You know, Francis. De... <laughs> anyway, I think I got some of my saints kind of <laughs> jumbled there. So forgive me for that. Uh, but these bugs out here are starting to kind of, well, there's, the bugs out here are starting to bug me. So I'm getting a little distracted. But anyway, apparently um, the, his nephew uh, was confirmed and apparently... Uh, I guess Pope Francis uh, was wishing this nephew of his well. Okay. Um, but then, I guess, apparently, um, there was a little P.S. and Pope Francis was encouraging uh, Jimmy Martin on his uh, ministry uh, to the uh, uh, LGBT types. And uh, so anyway, uh, a lot of Christians, a lot of Catholics, uh, very traditional-minded, very orthodox-minded, were very disappointed because it seemed like Again, 
the, the Vatican or the Pope, they kind of speak out of both sides of their mouth. They kind of uh, speak with forked tongue, if you will. Because a few months back, they did say that, you know, we cannot bless same-sex unions. Um, and yet, and now it seems, to, to, to a lot of people, it seems like it's a kind of a, a, a backhanded um, or a backdoor uh, gesture to people in the, in the gay movement. And so there was a lot of uh, consternation, a lot of disappointment, because we were kind of thinking, well, now it seems like the Pope is going to be a little bit more firm and be more clear about what the church authentically teaches. We were hoping that. Well, apparently with this letter, and everybody believes that it is genuine, it's authentic, so, you know, it's sort of like, well, okay, what are we, what are we to make of this? Okay. So um, <laughs> um, all I can say is simply a couple of things about this. Um, about this letter. Now, he says in the letter that Pastor Martin was basically trying to follow the, the example of God the Father by being close, tender, and compassionate. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with being compassionate and close and tender. Okay, but, but here's the problem, is when people interpret that as approbation for what they're doing, basically saying, well, obviously what I'm doing is fine and there's no problem with that. See, another thing that he needed to also say uh, is that, uh, you know, you also have to be authentic and truthful. You can't be deceiving people, okay? Because, again, if you're allowing somebody to think that they have the church's approval to live a certain lifestyle, the problem is if that person dies in a state of mortal sin, they are going to be eternally in heaven, I mean, in hell forever. Now, I know some people don't want to hear that. Um, uh, there's a wonderful young priest. He's uh, the Divine Mercy Priest. I think his name is Father Chris Alar. And he had a wonderful video I saw just the other day all about the reality of hell and how not to go there. And so I'm going to put a link to that video, if I remember, <laughs> into my uh, little bucket, sand bucket down below. So you might want to go check that video out. Again, this Father Chris, unlike... Pastor Jimmy Martin uh, is, a, is a good priest and he's telling people the truth in compassion and love. And that's what you have to have. You can't just be encouraging people to do destructive things, okay? Now, it, it, it could be seen as, well, you know, maybe the, the Pope is just trying to be compassionate, um, you know, and again, he didn't really say, well, he, there's a lot he didn't say that he should have said, okay? So again, we have to be very careful that we are authentic with people and not just telling them what they want to hear. Because why? Because the, the, the result, the eternal results are, are, are out of this world, really. I mean, if you uh, encourage somebody to continue in a way of life that is destructive, both personally and in, 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 in this world and in the world to come, the next world, you're not really being really truly loving and compassionate, okay? So that's why, you know, sometimes people, you know, feel like I'm a hard, you know, a person. I'm, I don't have a lot of compassion. Um, you know, some people say, well, you're borderlanding on bigotry, you know. I'm sure a few people said, no, buddy, you've crossed that line a long time ago. Okay. And that may be your, your opinion. But you have to weigh everything with what the church authentically teaches. Not what a theologian like James Martin says. He's going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm a recovering alcoholic, and the people that I love to hang around with were people that would like to drink like me. Oh, just have another one. It's okay. You know, just, just have a little one, you know. You only live once, you know, right? I love those people. You know, I go to a place, and they're, they're open up, you know, the Jack Daniels or the, you know, the you know, Johnny Walker Black Label or whatever it is, or the, you know, giving me a G&T, and man, they were my friends. Boy, I loved them, you know. But the people that knew that I had a problem, they'd say, maybe you need to take a look at that. This is not good for you. Look at what it's doing to your body. Look at what it's doing to your, your character, you know. Look at what it's doing to your, your general health and your spiritual life. I didn't want to hear what they had to say. Boy, I, I thought those people were pretty mean-spirited and insensitive and intolerant and bigots, you know. Well, but they were trying to tell me the truth, okay. So I would just say that, yes, we need to be compassionate, but let me tell you this, the worst thing you can do is deceive somebody. To me, that's the worst thing in the world because when you tell somebody 
that what they're doing is okay and it's not, shame on you. Shame on this guy, okay? This guy right there, okay? Shame on him because he's letting people think that what they're doing is perfectly okay. It has the blessings of the Pope. It has the blessings of the church, i.e. it has the blessings of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't. Okay? We have to be honest. Jesus, yes, he wants to accompany us and he wants to love us into a new way of life. Now, you might say, well, okay, maybe the Pope is, <clears throat> you know, Pope hasn't really said that he's encouraging, you know, LGBT lifestyle or anything like that. And true, he hasn't. And maybe you're saying, well, you know, the bottom line is it's, it's better to encourage people with positive reinforcement than negative reinforcement. And let me tell you, I get it. I know where you're coming from. Driving around here on the lake, beautiful time of year, you know, absolutely gorgeous, but there's an awful lot of traffic out here. And uh, you've got to be really, really on your toes because we've got bikers and walkers and hikers and people carrying paddle boards and canoes and you, you name it. We got it. We got them every. We got all. We got all of them up here. And you have to really be careful. And you got to be watching the signs. Now there are two places uh, up here that have signs that tell you to slow down. Now one of them I'll tell you is very harsh and abrupt, and the other one is actually kind of fun. And uh, the one that's harsh and abrupt, you know, it, it, you know if, you're go, if you're going one iota over, it flashes these big, angry words, slow down. You know, and eventually, you know, I kind of slow down. I will tell you this, though, that um, I uh, don't like that sign. And usually what I do is I wait till the very moment it starts flashing the angry sign at me, then I slow down. But there's another one, completely different, and it shows a little smiley face. It shows a little smiley face as you're slowing down. And when you slow down to the right speed, a little smiley face comes up. You know, it's like, oh, I got my smiley face. I will slow down intentionally just to see that doggone smiley face. Okay. Yes, positive reinforcement. Yes, absolutely. I think most parents would say, yeah, no, believe it or not, it does work. But it's not encouraging and condoning bad behavior or sinful behavior or destructive behavior. That's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is get somebody to go from being doing something that they shouldn't be doing and getting them to, you know, getting to a, the right place where they need to be with God. Okay? That's what, we, that what Jesus came to do is call us to repentance and conversion. You know, he didn't call us to be comfortable in our sin. He called us to uh, repent of our sin and be converted. Okay? So there you go. And that's what, you know, hopefully, you know, if he, this person, this guy over here, if he had a true ministry to the LGBT, he would be encouraging them not just to come out of the closet and telling them that it's okay to be gay. He would be calling them that to be liberated from all that. It's one thing to come out of the closet. It's one thing to come out of the whole gay lifestyle. And I'm happy to say that there is a growing movement of former uh, homosexuals, same-sex uh, same -sex attracted people that are coming completely out of that gay movement. And that's something we rejoice in, okay? Now, it's not just picking on the LGBT types, okay? It's all of us probably, and all, most of us, if not all of us, have struggled with, with our human sexuality at one point or another in our lives, okay? It's just part of, I guess, part of being a human being. Again, not making excuses for it, but identifying it for what it is and then with God's grace, asking him to set us free from these things. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to liberate us from these destructive behaviors, these destructive lifestyles. That's what God wants to do for all of us. Now, this is where we get into the, the gospel today. Because you see, Jesus is aware that these people have come to hear him uh, minister and preach. Uh, they've seen him do these really great works you know, again, that positive kind of reinforcement, like, wow, this guy really looks like he knows what he's doing, you know, and so they're attracted to him for, for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, maybe some of them are a little more on the carnal side, you know, like, hey, maybe he can give me something to eat. Maybe he can, you know, I don't know, help me win the lottery. I don't know. But the thing is that they, they're, they're attracted to the positive things that Jesus is doing, and that's all good. But uh, so they come, and so now the disciples, though, are kind of getting nervous because they realize, wait a minute, uh-oh, it's getting, you know, getting kind of dusky out here and uh, maybe Jesus needs to kind of cut it short and tell them to go home and, you know, so they can go get something to eat. 
But that's not what he wants them to do. He wants to ask the disciples, you know, he says, you basically give them something to eat. But what he, what he really is doing is something I think a lot more interesting. He's testing them. We're even told that in the gospel. He's testing them to see what, see what they if they have this understanding. Because what do they do? They look at what they don't have. They limit Jesus. They limit God. And see, this is, and you're probably wondering, well, how does that tie in with James Martin and LGBT stuff? Trust me, I'll get there. But so what happens is they, 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 they realize, okay, now Jesus has kind of said, let's feed these people. And so he's, they kind of like bumble around, you know, a couple of them say, well, you know, hmm, well, we got, a, there's a kid here that at least has five loaves and a couple of fish. But again, that's not enough. We're limited. All they did is they looked at what they don't have. Jesus asked them basically, what do you have? You know, don't look at what you don't have. Don't look at the limitations. Just look at what you've got. That's all you, that's all he asked them basically to do. What do you got? Okay. And, and a lot of times I think in our lives, we limit God. Well, we put limitations. In other words, it's not God that is limited. God is not limited. God is obviously, he's omnipotent. He, he can do anything whenever he wants to do and, how, and chooses how he wants to do it. We don't really know exactly how Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes. We just know that he did. And he takes what seems to be scarcity, the little petty stuff that we have, piddly stuff that we have, and he brings this huge increase. He doesn't just meet the need. I mean, he normally does that. When what, whatever we do, we give him in trust and, you know, we offer it up. But he gives more. It's more. It's this great abundance. It's not just this little, you know, kind of meager kind of like, well, okay, here's a little crumb for you, and here's a little crumb for you, and here's a little piece of fish for you. No. It says that they ate their fill. And what and after their fill, there was stuff left over. So again, it's like, okay, do we limit God by our own? limitations spiritually emotionally mentally psychologically you know because a lot of us do that now and that's why I, i'm getting, getting back to the you know uh, pastor martin and uh, the lgbt folks is a lot of people have been kind of basically told that and it's a lie that uh, well they were made this way you know this perversion that they're uh, attracted to and that they're they can't be set free from it say so they limit god and i would just say that if you are thinking that way, because a lot of people have said, well, you know, you don't understand, you know, uh, I was born this way and I, I have to, I have to, I have to express myself this way. I have to, you know, uh, celebrate my sexual identity. You know, I have to be free to do that. You know, it's like, well, no, you don't, God does God calls us to freedom, not so we can practice sin, but that we can practice virtue. And the problem with Pastor Martin is that he tries to cloak a vice with virtue, okay? This whole idea of him bringing out this letter from Pope Francis is basically trying to cloak vice, i.e., you know, same-sex attraction and pervertedness with, oh, well, look, the Pope seems to be endorsing this. The Pope seems to be okay with you being gay. And I think that's deceptive and it's wrong. And that's not true love. It's not true authentic Christianity. And so God wants to call these people out but again, if you're going to limit God and say, well, I can't be set free from this sin. Really? You sure about that? God can't set you free? I believe that he can. Okay? God can set us free from anything. But we have to take the shackles off our own understandings and our own limitations in order for him to do that. And I know from personal experience that all you need to do in order for this to work is to have a desire doesn't have to be perfect you know uh, this this ties in with so many spiritual things and I've, I've and I've seen it personally in my own life where God has taken my broken you know desire my broken uh, understanding even and saying you know God I, I, I this is all I got this is all I got but I'm gonna give it to you and from that that's all he needs he just needs you to be a willing spirit 
to surrender these things and then let him do what he's going to do. I really believe that. I've seen it happen many times in my life. And I'm sure some of you have experienced the same thing. It's, it's not so much how you're going to figure it out, how you're going to set yourself free. Um, it's basically kind of just saying, you know, it's kind of like being beat up and broken and just saying, okay, God, here you go. You know, it's like the, with the five loaves and the two fish, we don't really know the condition of those. They may not, they might've been, well, these, this, fit, this bread here is like kind of stale. It's, you know, you know, it's hard as a rock. You know, the fish are a little smelly, you know, they're not, they're not fresh. You know, they, you could probably eat them and you'd be okay, but boy, ooh, it's going to be hard to put that down. You know, whatever you have, no matter how imperfect it is, you know, give it to, give it to the Lord. Don't limit him. He can, he can set you free and he longs to set you free. He, that's his desire, you know. So hopefully, you know, as you listen to the gospel today, you know, ask yourself, what limitations have I put on God? How do I limit him in my life? And then kind of say, okay, let's not do that anymore. Let's just with trust and confidence, take everything that we have, broken, good, whatever, and just offer it up. Say, Lord, here you go. Take this and, and really turn this into something that's going to glorify you. Okay? That, I think, is the message of this wonderful gospel. And then, don't be surprised at the great abundance that you'll find left over when God does the miracle in your life. May God bless you today and every day. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.